All right. Good evening, everybody. We're glad to have you join us tonight. Um, this is one of our uh, Thursday night uh, economics of agriculture meeting, and we have a little different topic tonight. It'll be uh, the uh, 2019 Kansas Farm Income Report. Uh, the KFMA has been working on that, and they've got it put together. We've also got stuff posted on our Ag Manager site, so you can uh, view the specifics of it. Uh, just a couple of things before we start. Uh, the chat is down at the bottom of your screen in the middle there. You can click on that and uh, type questions for them. And then uh, if you keep your video off, uh, we're going to let Kevin, uh, we'll make you look at him and uh, Mark here while they're presenting. After they're done then, we're going to have uh, some uh, projections on the grain and livestock markets with uh, Greg Ibendahl and also uh, Glenn Tonzer. So uh, we'll switch slides and move to that then when these guys are done. But with that, Kevin, I'll let you take it away. Very good. Thank you, Rich. And certainly appreciate everyone being together with us here tonight as we uh, take a look at some of the information from the, the uh, Kansas Farm Management Association uh, summary as we put that together this year. Certainly a, a different year of putting these things together as we sought to do so, uh, working at a distance in a lot of uh, instances with things. So uh, we're thankful for the efforts of the KFMA economists around the state and certainly for uh, those who are the KFMA members for their willingness to uh, be a part of this program. KFMA has, has worked with farm families here in the state of Kansas for, uh, for many years. And currently we do have uh, around 2,000 farm families that we work with. About 1,000 of those will have uh, information that's uh, complete and, and prepared to be in the analysis numbers that we look at uh, tonight. And, and we'll give some contact information uh, later as well. But uh, on the agmanager.info website at the KFMA link, you can find uh, information on our analysis summaries from 2000. Uh, 19 as well as uh, prior years and the ability for um, certainly farms that are a part of the KFMA program but also all farms to be able to uh, benchmark and compare uh, check their numbers and and I think gives us a good um, kind of a barometer of be able to being able to look at uh, agriculture in Kansas and how that changes uh, from year to year so we will not in any fashion be presenting uh, all of the numbers uh, that come out of this analysis summary here tonight but just uh, Mark and I will seek to uh, bring a number of things out that we think are very, uh, very important as we consider uh, what, what we're able to see and, and uh, what's presented to us. Uh, just a reminder here, uh, tomorrow morning, there will be a, um, another webinar, ability to register, register for this at the agmanager.info website, but looking at the uh, Coronavirus uh, Food Assistance Program, uh, CFAP, the payments that will be coming out of that. Uh, involved with that will be Robin Reed from our department, along with some individuals from the state FSA office. So an opportunity at that point to uh, get uh, direct information as to uh, how that program is going to work, what some of the dollars will look like with it, how to get signed up, and uh, ask questions regarding that now. I know there's a lot of questions uh, regarding um, the, the CFAP program and how that's going to work. Uh, we will not be looking to address those tonight, but there is available uh, at nine tomorrow and that will be recorded as well for, uh, for information to, uh, to learn about that program. Okay, KFMA net income. Uh, from those uh, farms that we work with, the average net income at the state level in uh, 2019, uh, is 110,380. Uh, that is a about a 9% increase from where the number was in, in 2018 at just over 101,000. Uh, know, within that, a, a broad range of, of different uh, levels of income. Our top 25% farms uh, averaged a little over 330,000. Uh, the bottom 25% near a $45,000 loss uh, within this group of farms. There were about 18% of the farms showing, showing a loss in, uh, in 2019. And uh, we'll be looking here as we uh, move through this, discussing some of the differences amongst the uh, various associations around the state, as well as um, 
some some primary factors affecting that looking at uh, looking at 2019 if we um, bring in the numbers here from the six different associations we had two areas of the state uh, that showed a drop in net income in 2019 from 2018 and four areas of the state showing an increase uh, the two areas with the drop uh, certainly a lot of impact of uh, of excess moisture you might say in those regions but uh, the low the low net income was in south central kansas a uh, little over 70,500 that was uh, about a 30,000 drop from uh, where the net income had been in 2018 and in uh, southeast kansas uh, just over 111,000 which was about a 25,000 drop from where that had been in uh, the year uh, prior in the areas with the increases, uh, fairly substantial increases in Western Kansas, uh, Northwest Kansas going from about 116,000 in 2018 to just over 127 in 2019. And in the Southwest part of the state, going from about 153,000 in 18 to just over 188,000 in 2019. Uh, Northeast and North Central Kansas, very similar net incomes uh, both uh, just under 110,000 with North Central at 109,961, Northeast 109,768. Mark, I'll let you start here. So um, let's take a look real quick at some of what the driving factors were uh, for, for income levels across the state. Um, the, the, big, the primary factor was moisture both in a positive and negative impact. Um, in, in the western part of the state, um, particularly northwest and in parts of the North Central Association, um, very strong dryland fall crops um, that, that um, drove uh, net farm income up. Um, in the southwest portion, and again, portions of northwest and north central, um, very good wheat yields uh, that again drove, drove uh, incomes up. Um, <clears throat> In, in the eastern part of the state, the, the story was a little bit different. Um, excessive moisture um, starting in the fall of, of the previous year in 2018 and through, through planting time and, and uh, in, in 2019 uh, really hampered um, or, or uh, scaled back yields. Um, that even um, in some areas of the state, we saw some prevented plant acres. Um, that ended up from our, from our data, that's roughly two and a half percent of the, the crop acres covered under uh, or with, with within uh, KFMA farms were, were prevented plant. Um, this moisture um, through the winter also caused um, some difficulties for livestock producers. Um, management was a struggle. Um, death loss was higher than normal, uh, caused by muddy conditions, poor weather and so on. Really, uh, really hurt that, that sector. Um, again, moisture. Uh, resulted in some strong hay and forage yields, but quickly growing uh, grasses um, ended up with uh, with maybe some lower quality forages than than, than would be typical. And as in many years, uh, fluctuating market prices had an had an impact on the uh, on net incomes. And one of the um, the, the significant things that we're going to talk about uh, in in one of the, the, the driving factors for, for the net farm income levels where they are is uh, government payments and in particular um, MFP or market facilitation program payments. Um, looking across the state, um, the, uh, um, the average, as Kevin mentioned before, the, the state uh, net farm income average was 110,000. Of that, about 55% was um, market facilitation program payments. And um, that, that percentage of net farm income varied uh, throughout the state from um, a low of 39% in the Northeast Association to a high of 80% in the South Central Association. So MFP had a very big impact on, on net farm incomes for the When we look at all government payments, um, including ARC and PLC, um, uh, other state payments or wh whatever might be, whatever else might be included, um, 
statewide, it was about 72% of the net farm income, about $80,000 total in, in government payments. Um, again, quite a range, um, anywhere from 55% of net farm income in the Northeast to 110% of net farm income in South Central. Um, other associations ranging from 60 to, to 80%. So again, very strong influence, very, very much a driving factor in the net farm income levels. across the state. We'll look at things one, the government payments one more, uh, slightly different way. Um, for the state, again, 110,380 net farm income. If we take net, um, MFP payments out of that, net farm income would have been 49963 um, If we take all government payments out, again, about $80,000, net farm income average across the state would have been $30,361. Um, the South Central Association would point out that taking away government payments completely um, would have put net farm income at a negative level. And even if with with um, with only ARC PLC and other traditional um, payments, um, they still would have been um, re reduced down to, to about fourteen thousand dollars of of income. Okay, and if we look um, a little more into uh, to some of the detail uh, of those. Um, Payments here. This is uh, reflecting MFP payments. Uh, we we do know that uh, with MFP payments, we had uh, a fairly substantial impact in 2018 of those payments, and then had as we went into 2019 a change in the way those uh, payments were computed and the way those amounts were allocated. Here, what we've done is just take the uh, the group of KFMA farms and looking here in this case at a percent of value of farm production coming from those uh, market facilitation payments. The gray bars representing here uh, 2018 and the purple 2019. And so what you're seeing here is the uh, number of farms uh, within these different percentage levels um, that are across the, uh, the bottom of the, of the chart. So, the zero to 1%, just a couple of things to point out here. The zero to 1%, those are gonna be farms who received none or uh, very little uh, MFP payments. And you can see there was a, a large difference in uh, what that was showing between 2018 and 2019. The 2018 payments uh, driven uh, on the crop side, uh, very um, directly on bushels produced in 2019, uh, those based on acres and even some of the crops that were able to be uh, accounted for as acres to receive a payment were uh, acreages that would not have had payments in 2018. And so a big impact here on the percent of farms or the number of farms uh, that received very small or no payments in, uh, in 2019. And then can see within here, just as a percent of value of farm production, a shifting uh, over to the right or a higher percent of value of farm production coming uh, or reflected by those um, MFP payments. And in, in um, the earlier slides, we were looking relative to uh, net farm income. In this case, we're looking at uh, the value of farm production to allow uh, looking across farms, both those with um, positive incomes and losses, and just to assess how that looks between the two years. Mark? So we've, we've talked a little bit about, um, about 19. Let's look back. Um, we're going to go back to 1970 and look at um, income trends. These are all inflation adjusted um, net farm income amounts starting in 1970 going uh, on, on to, uh, to 2019. Um, I'll note that these are all adjusted to $2018. Um, so keep, keep that in mind as you look. Um, the, uh, the purple bar, the, the horizontal bar indicates the average uh, net farm income for a particular decade. So the 98,000 average net farm income in the, in the 70s um, based in 2018 dollars. Um, in the 80s, that dropped down to 35,000. 
an average for the entire decade, bumped up to 61 in, in the 90s, up to 82 in the 2000s, and then average for the teens has been 110,000. And that's, that's a, a fairly high level considering um, the, the state level net farm income or for, for 2015 was below 10,000. You'll notice that 1973 um, is a spike there. Um, in 2018 dollars, that net farm income was 257,000. Um, that was the average across the entire state. So pretty significant income for that year. Let's look then or add, add into this chart, we're gonna add government payments across the bottom. So we're looking at real dollars, the real or the, the inflation adjusted um, government payment amount for each of those years. Notice in quite a few of those years, government payments are greater than net farm income. So um, there, the, in, in those years, they were a, a very significant help um, to, to, to farmers across the state. Um, go ahead, Kevin, go to the next one. And then the, the last look that we wanna take at this, um, this history, this inflation adjusted history, We've added the, um, the, the, the um, black horizontal bar that's, that's been added is the average net farm income for each decade if government payments were excluded. So um, in the 70s, um, not much of an impact there, um, about a $10,000 impact um, over the average of the, the decade. Again, you've got that one year in 1973 that's really driving things up, carrying the average for the decade. Um, into the 80s, the difference is, is pushing $30,000 in difference between uh, net farm income with and without government payments. Um, $30,000 again in, uh, in, uh, in the 90s, almost $40,000 gap between the two in the in the 2000s and then um, in, in, again in the in the in the teens uh, a very significant gap or, or difference between the two uh, the two averages so again we just wanted to illustrate um, kind of the importance of that safety net that is government payments it's and, and I think um, going forward it's it's going to be uh, as much or, or more important than it than it has been throughout the last 50 years. Maybe Mark, uh, a couple of things I do notice there's a um, couple of questions there. One is regarding uh, wheat and milo PLC payments and, and I think we'll uh, leave that uh, when Greg Ibendahl steps in here after a bit, he's going to do some uh, 2020 projected things and, and I think we'll leave that to be uh, to be looked at at that time. Uh, then the question here, uh, and I think this fits, this is what I wanted to go ahead and look at here uh, at this point in time. The question, is it sustainable that 72% uh, of farm income comes from government payments? And I think uh, we could probably have a long debate about what's sustainable or not in the midst of that. Uh, I think to look back and see uh, what is the purpose behind why those uh, payments were being made and certainly the, the fact of the MFP and the, the strong influence that um, what is done at the government level relative to relationships with, uh, with other governments relative to trade issues and, and how does all of that flow back into uh, income available. Uh, also just the importance to our uh, to our uh, overall economy, to our government, to, to this country relative to uh, what do we have for a, a food policy? How, how strong of a network do we want to have relative to the ability to uh, produce the food that we eat and to do so at a level that can be, uh, can be done as cheaply as possible for, uh, for those that are purchasing the food uh, seems to be a lot of the focus of some of that. But uh, you know, within here, I mentioned the um, different um, net income groups, our high net income, our low net income group, and, and uh, certainly there the low net income uh, with a negative, uh, negative farm income, uh, a good share of those farms had, uh, had um, you know, a level of government payments uh, equal to, um, 
less than what was needed just to bring them up to, uh, up to zero. The percentage on that top 25%, and I don't have that right with me here, Mark, but uh, it was actually uh, substantially less than what some of these averages are. And so, uh, so there are uh, a great deal of variance from farm to farm. And uh, what is sustainable over the long term is certainly going to be the ability to uh, produce what's being produced at a given farm at a level that can be profitable uh, without the government payments uh, being a part of that. That's, that's certainly to answer the question, what's most sustainable? Uh, that is the place we need to be. Uh, what would you add there, Mark? <clears throat> I think I'll avoid the that, that debate for now. <laughs> You've answered that question well. All right, get, get where I'm actually not advancing other things on my computer and advancing the slide we're each looking at. Um, Certainly a, a important part of things that are taking place uh, for agriculture right now, for Kansas farms right now, are uh, where are we at relative to uh, our equity position on the farm? Uh, where are we at relative to uh, cash that's available, uh, the working capital position? The next two slides here, we're going to look at uh, some of those things. Again, going back to uh, the early 70s and uh, assessing some of this over the long term. So the gray Gray bar here is across, uh, across the slide. You have, uh, these are inflation adjusted. Uh, so inflation adjusted debt levels uh, from 1973 through 2019. And then the, the purple line representing the, the debt to asset ratio. And uh, a lot of uh, different things that we could draw out of this. Uh, we'll just look at a few, a few things here. But if we, uh, Assessed back here in the 70s, certainly what's seen is uh, somewhat of a golden age age for agriculture uh, with the um, activity that was taking place. And you can see here uh, during the 70s, some debt levels increasing. Um, while those uh, debt levels were increasing, we had a, a uh, increasing um, debt to asset level. Uh, we, we hit uh, the late part here and uh, seeing a um, decreased debt to asset right here at the late 70s, but then entered into the 80s. And uh, while we were seeing debt levels uh, decrease, we saw the debt to asset increase, which uh, certainly does represent what was a uh, primary player of things in the midst of the uh, farm crisis of the 80s were the uh, decreasing asset values, primarily decreasing land values that were um, influencing the positions a lot of farms found themselves in at that point in time. Well, let's uh, jump forward to what do things look like today if we go to the right-hand side and come into the uh, late 2000s and the uh, 2010 through 2019 period. We've seen a decrease relative to those, uh, those debt-to-asset levels and then a fairly level uh, debt-to-asset level staying here between 20 to 25% on average uh, while we've seen fairly substantial increases in overall debt on these farms. Certainly coming off of uh, those strong years and in the midst of the uh, strong income years of 07, 08 through 2013, 2014. Uh, the, the opportunity then during those years to look at land purchases and uh, some of this debt coming from that. Uh, even as uh, Mark and I talked this over some, we were also in generating some of the, the incomes that we had at that time, doing a fair bit of tax planning. And uh, we've got equipment, equipment investment, our equipment investment per acre uh, growing during that time period as well. But uh, certainly can know we've got the asset side also increasing uh, along with our debt increases as our uh, debt to asset level stays in that 20 to 25% uh, level. Anything you would add here, Mark? No, I think you've covered it. Our, our next slide does look then at. Um, Working capital, uh, working capital being the uh, current assets minus current liabilities of a farm, uh, looking there at uh, what's available for uh, cash to uh, look at operations on this farm. Here again, going from the early 70s up to um, the current years. And so working capital itself is the gray bar. Um, 
that to assess or, or uh, discuss it just in itself, a uh, level of dollars of working capital. In a given circumstance, you can understand what that means for a given farm uh, across a range of farms, uh, other than um, measuring some trends relative to some other factor, it's hard to make uh, much of a statement about it. Uh, so a working capital ratio is very useful from that standpoint and, and uh, one that we like to use relative to assessing working capital is a ratio looking at working capital relative to operating expenses plus interest. Uh, the working capital, the revenue generated on a farm is, is necessary, it's needed to, uh, to cover those operating expenses, the interest expense that farm's going to occur, incur during, uh, during that, uh, that year of operation. And as we assess this, uh, you could think of this uh, working capital ratio at a 1.0 would effectively represent that, that, uh, that a farm had sufficient working capital as a year began to cover the operating expense, interest expense that was going to be incurred uh, during that next 12 months. And so uh, a ratio at 30% at, uh, or so is gonna say there's uh, more like a third of, uh, of those dollars available. You can see here that our working capital level from a dollar standpoint, we're certainly, and these again are inflation adjusted numbers, uh, we're very strong back here in the early part of the 70s, uh, dropped off fairly dramatically going into the 80s. <clears throat> uh, the ratio, kind of jumping around all over the place, but um, running at a level here uh, under 60% under for a good part of uh, the early part of the 80s. It did strengthen then going into the 90s. Uh, the low across this 50 year history is um, here in the early 2000s uh, when it got down below, uh, below 40%. During the strong years of uh, 20, 2007 through 13, we were, up here around a 90% level. And then more recently, our average and, and uh, the average for um, 2018 ends up coming in here at about 73%. Uh, within there, just to discuss how does that look for different profit levels, uh, our different profit level farms, our bottom 25% farms in 2019 uh, had a, uh, working capital to uh, operating expense plus interest ratio of uh, 32, uh, 32 to 33%, 32.63. The uh, top 25% farms, it was at 92. So a very, very substantial difference. But I think for all farms, one of the things that we've seen the last uh, four, to, four to five years here is a contraction of available cash uh, operating on a tighter tighter cash level. And I think the farms that find themselves in the best financial position for making decisions um, at this point in time are farms that have been able to maintain themselves at a fairly strong uh, working capital position. Mark? I think you've covered it. Okay, that would be, uh, Coming up to the end of uh, our slides here, uh, we do have just some contact information there, email and phone numbers, both for uh, Mark and myself, as well as a couple of website uh, addresses there. One that's looking at um, where the executive summary for 2019 has been posted. Um, other uh, KFMA analysis information will also be uh, posted uh, on the KFMA website and then also some contact information for the KFMA program. Uh, if anyone wants to know more about the program or any interest in membership, uh, certainly on that contact page, you can uh, locate the information for Mark or I, or as well as for uh, economists that we have stationed uh, around the state in our six different associations. So we would certainly welcome an opportunity to uh, visit with any of you, uh, either about opportunity to be a KFMA member or about uh, utilizing the KFMA data to uh, benchmark and assess things on your own farm. Rich, are there any questions we ought to address before moving to Greg? Yes, uh, there are from uh, John Campbell. There were a couple, I think. Uh, his first one was right below Louise's question earlier. Is it sustainable that 72% of farm income comes from the government? Since that income is subject to the whims of politics, what does it mean 
what does that mean for the farm economy? And then he has another one down further. Okay. Well, in that one regarding the um, seventy-two percent, the sustainability of that, uh, you know, I think it certainly does mean that we're in a. Uh, what does it mean for the farm economy? We're we're in a, a very tight cash flow uh, position relative to where our our market prices are currently at. So I think that um, that does uh, address that. Just looking. Okay, the size of farm. Uh, between, on average, the um, average acres per farm is uh, just under 2,500 acres for the average farm in KFMA. The uh, crop acres on those farms is uh, about 1,700 acres. Uh, the variation of those, uh, and we can maybe uh, type something in the chat. I'm not going to have that just right in front of me here, but uh, we can type something in the chat relative or certainly the data posted, but it's going to range uh, from um, slightly under that in the Northeast region of the state uh, to uh, a number that is uh, not too far off of 40% uh, higher than that in the uh, Western, Western regions of the state. Uh, so that would be just kind of a broad answer to that regarding the uh, average farm size. And then Kevin, uh, just above that a little bit uh, from Glenn Sears. How much impact did the devaluation of assets have on liquidity trends? Certainly they're looking at the, um, the, the, the lowering of uh, our crop prices uh, moving into particularly in, and um, in the 2015 year. So, so actually if we just here slightly back up to um, here where um, this, uh, this big drop that takes place here relative to that working capital ratio, uh, right here there's a substantial uh, influence of uh, changing uh, grain prices going into, particularly looking at what our inventories uh, were able to be valued at uh, coming into um, the 2015 year. So um, the answer to that is, is uh, certainly, certainly there's a fairly substantial impact and I think that's going to be a place where that could could uh, fairly closely be uh, identified. Would you agree with that, Mark? Yeah. Okay, any others there we ought to not miss before we move on, Rich? I think- Yeah, James Coover, uh, was there a discrepancy between net profit of crop operations, which is the majority of KFMA data, to the cattle operations, or more of did lack of government payments to cattle operations create a difference in profits? Well, cer certainly there is a, um, if we look at our, um, in our, in our executive summary on page, uh, on the second page would be a place, some of that could be identified, certainly looking at different uh, farm types and net income levels. Our, our KFMA member farms do tend to be uh, very heavy percentage wise as, uh, as crop operations compared to, uh, to cattle. Uh, but uh, certainly, and Greg, Greg will be addressing as he looks at his uh, 2020 uh, projections and such, we'll be having some discussion of, of crop versus livestock and comparing the primary crop farms to uh, the rest of the farms and the impact of, of some of those things moving forward. But uh, certainly in 2019, uh, several of our um, cattle feeding uh, together with crop um, farm types uh, were a couple of our higher uh, net farm income groups, um, so so that that certainly is uh, is referenced there. But uh, the difference in the focus of a lot of what was in, and you saw with the government payments, just to answer James here with uh, with those, the uh, the largest share of those government payments were the MFP payments, which uh, certainly were uh, very very heavily focused uh, to crop farms. So. So uh, without a doubt, that would, uh, would say there was a, a role that that played in where the net income, where net income came, came to be for those different farm types. Well, I'm gonna talk about what's gonna happen with our KFMA farms using that same set of data that Kevin just showed and project what's gonna happen into 2020. And as you might guess, uh, the coronavirus has been a big factor on about every aspect of life and certainly agriculture is no different. So what I'm gonna show you 
certainly coronavirus is partially responsible for what I'm going to predict in 2020, but it's not the only thing. So if you're going to do a, a true coronavirus effect on the farm economy, you really would probably have to take projections for prices without the coronavirus at the first of the year and then compare them with what actually happened and get an idea that way. I'm just going to compare prices based on what happened in 2019 and compare those to what we project is going to happen in 2020. I also went back and adjusted yields on the grain, on grain crops too. So like certain cases, like for wheat especially, we had a, uh, definitely had an above average year for wheat yields last year. So I'm going to adjust that back down to more of a trend yield for 2020,000 projection as well. So keep that in mind when you're looking at that, that this is not truly a coronavirus projection. It's just our projection for net farm income for this coming year. All right, well, as you might have guessed, you know, certainly livestock is going to take a big hit in this coming year. Just looking at the revenue side from livestock, we're showing across all livestock categories about a 20% reduction in revenue. And it's kind of equal from the beef side and the swine side. Uh, certainly, as you've been hearing, this, this, the hog side is probably going to take a, a bigger hit than 20%. But some of the data I've been looking at um, shows that we were actually expecting higher prices going into 2020 as well here. So looking at the Iowa State card analysis, they're actually projecting a 30% decline due to the coronavirus. But from our data looking at, when we start from a 2019 baseline, uh, it's not gonna quite be 30%. I, I, I ended up using like a forecast of a 20% reduction in swine too. So altogether, a pretty good jump, a pretty good drop in our, in our value of production from the uh, livestock side. On the crop side, kind of the same situation. Again, we started with prices from our KFMA enterprise studies, which I believe are our ag manager right now, I think, Kevin, yes. And uh, use those as kind of the starting point here. And then I talked to Dan O'Brien and he gave me some prices for what he projects is gonna happen in the coming year. And then I adjusted the yields accordingly so they would match like the five-year average yields across crop reporting districts. So when we do that, we basically end up with uh, Corn revenue being 16% lower, uh, grain sorghum being 5% lower, soybeans 11% lower, and eight and wheat 8% lower. But again, wheat's really not that much different in price compared to last year. It was really only about 1% due to the the price. The 7% uh, decline is really adjusting from what was really a good wheat yield year back to more of a normal what happened in 2020. Uh, looking at the government payment changes, so. Uh, Obviously, the MFP payment was a big payment last year for government payments. When we take that out, the average KFMA farm had a, a government payment number of about 20000 Since we don't know, and we're probably pretty sure that we're not going to have an MFP, well, I don't want to say for sure, because when it comes to the government, you never really can tell for sure. But uh, assuming we don't have an MFP, I kind of looked at the government payments without the MFP in 2019 to compare that with our projection that we're going to have in 2020. Well, the one good thing with lower prices that does tend to make the um, chances of getting a government payment should better that be higher. And uh, again, this year I'm predicting that our government payment number is going to about double when you take out that MFP number. So we'll be pretty close to forty thousand dollars per KFMA farm on the uh, government payment side. Again, most of our farms, their base is in uh, PLC for practically everything, except for soybeans. Some of the soybeans in the southeast part of the state. Um, they, went, they went with our county, but again, if soybeans aren't really expecting to have a payment there, so it's probably not a big thing, just focusing on the PLC side. Um, according to our April update, and if you go to Ag Manager and look under uh, publications by Rich Llewellyn and Art Barnaby, they are doing monthly projections for what the PLC payment is. This is from their um, April update. I think they'll have a May one coming out here probably pretty soon. But we are projecting wheat at 88 cents a bushel, Sorghum, 77 cents a bushel, and, and, and corn at uh, seven bushels per acre. So for this year, at least, it pays to have a, a good wheat base because that's going to pay off pretty well for most folks. Um, looking at the crop insurance side, this one's a little bit tricky side to figure out because uh, most farmers here in the state uh, use crop revenue coverage at, at, at uh, corn and what uh, Dan tells me at about 75% rates. Um, and uh, these prices that go into those contracts, those were set really before we started to see the big decline in grain prices. So when, we, when those first came out, we were saying, well, these prices look pretty low for a crop insurance product. Now they're actually looking pretty good here. So that aspect 
would lead me to think that we might have higher crop uh, insurance payments this coming year. But offsetting that though is um, we're not going to probably have as many or as many preventive planting acres as we did last year. Now Kevin said we had three percent of our acres went into the preventive planting payout this past year. Uh, nationally, we set a record. I think there was 20 million acres, which was about double what it was before, thanks to wet weather pretty much across the entire U.S. here. So the fact that we will probably have higher prices going into the, the, the revenue side of that crop insurance product, but we also will pay off fewer acres for planning. Those two things will tend to cancel each other out. I'm still predicting a, about a 10% increase in our crop insurance payment for 2020. Again, that's very see of the pants calculation for that one. I'm um, on the expense side, so I guess there could be some you consider this good news here. We shouldn't have to pay as much for several of our expense items, especially fertilizer. Uh, I've developed a model where I look at the um, the price of oil that's lagged about nine months. I looked at the corn futures price, and it does seem to do a fairly good job of predicting fertilizer prices. So last year, the average anhydrous ammonia price across the U.S. was 560 in, in 2019. I'm projecting by the end of this year, probably about wheat planting time or so, that anhydrous could get down to 424 on a national price. I think we're all well on our way to getting there right now. Uh, the only problem though is, so that's a 24% reduction. Farmers aren't going to see that entire reduction in fertilizer price this year. But most farmers probably bought their fertilizer either the end of last year or beginning of this year. So a lot of this uh, reduction in fertilizer prices won't show up until next year's prices. So I guess that's a good thing looking forward to the 2021 uh, uh, growing years that you will have cheaper fertilizer then. I'm saying that that's 24% price reduction. We're gonna see farmers may be able to take maybe a, maybe about half that. So maybe looking at maybe a 12% reduction in fertilizer prices. Diesel's kind of the same way. It's down significantly so far this year, probably down about 20% in total. Again, farmers probably paid for a lot of their fuel before the price decline started occurring here. So again, I'm assuming about a 10% advantage to farmers this year. Uh, looking at our interest rates while farmers are paying, if we divide our total interest cost into our uh, total amount of farm debt, we end up with about a 4.5% 4, 4 average interest rate. Uh, last year in 2019, farmers did add more debt to their balance sheets, about 4% more. I'm assuming that we're going to add and equivalent 4% more again this coming year, which means that our interest expense will be 4% higher and assuming that interest rates stay roughly the same going into this coming year. So what does that mean for net farm income? Well, um, as Kevin said, our, our total when we included the government payments and with the MFP payments was like a 10 something. When you take out that MFP payment, that puts us down to right about, about $50,000. I'm forecasting, even with, gov with the government payments that I'm projecting, that that will drop down to about $14,000 for this coming year. That's quite a reduction. That's about a 71% reduction in net farm income uh, outside of having any extra special payments that we're, it looks like we're going to be having. So that's a pretty good reduction there. It's even worse if you are a uh, livestock farmer. I'm calling these non-grain farms because really you can break our KFMA database in the two main farm types, about two thirds to three quarters of our farm are grain farms. The other third are livestock farms, and I guess you can call them hybrid farms. They're kind of a mix of having a significant amount of grain, but also a pretty good amount of livestock too. So I'm putting all those into that second category. Those particular group of farms are gonna go from a $35,000 net farm income in 2019 to a negative almost $15,000 number in 2020. So that's not looking very good at all. That's 142% reduction for that farm group outside of any special payments that we may have coming up this year. Uh, looking at our how, how this would graph out. So this is a graph of a CDF and what it basically, way you read this is basically you find a point in the graph here and here's the point of zero net farm income for the 2020 farm series. This is saying basically 40%, uh, just above 40, whoops, just above 40% of our farms are going to earn zero profits or less or have negative net farm income here. So that's the way you look at this. It says 40, so that means anything to the left is going to be in that category. And you can see how that compares to the, um, the 2019 numbers with everything in there. Uh, just looking at grain farms, really grain farms aren't, uh, 
going to really do, do too bad in the, in the whole thing, everything considered here. So here, the red line is what happened last year. You see we have about maybe about 35% of our farms lost money last year. I'm predicting that's going to bump up to maybe just under 40%. So fairly comparable as far as the grain farms are concerned. Now the big change though is going to happen here for the non-grain farms when you look at last year's income to this year's income. So last year, we had about 40% of our farms lose money last year. This year, I'm predicting this green line that we will have fully 60% of our non-grain farms are gonna lose money without any kind of special payment occurring. Uh, you can see it over here. The bad thing is, especially when you look at the very, start looking at the tails here, is at this point right here where farmers are losing $75,000, there are 20% of our farms that are gonna fit in that category here. So not looking very good at all for the livestock farms in the state. So what can we conclude from this? Well, it's really a pretty bleak picture here, especially for the livestock farms. The only, the only good thing I see coming out of this is that, uh, and I, I would make sure to try to tune into that webinar tomorrow morning, is that there is some money available for this. I think right now nationally, it's about 16 billion. So hopefully, and then some of this, or a lot of this will go to livestock producers. So hopefully this will help alleviate some of the bleak picture I painted earlier just a second ago. So we'll have to wait and see what the details are for that. So sorry, I don't have better news, but uh, Glenn has a further slide about how this is going to affect livestock producers as well. Thank you, Greg. Fire this up, there we go. Uh, good evening, everybody. I am the last slide, I promise. Um, so just to give us some context to kind of augment what's been shared, uh, I pulled this slide together. Um, some of you might know from past webinars, I took a stab because I was asked to kind of give us context on the damage to the cattle industry in March. And then some of you may know that early in April, I was on a study um, as one of nine of us. Uh, it was led by uh, Daryl Peel down at Oklahoma State where we kind of redid that. Why am I telling you that? This story changes by the day, and I do this with caution uh, because while I'm presenting them to you, I think the scenario is going to change a lot between now and when a lot of people sell their cattle or their hogs, depending on what species we're talking about. Those disclaimers aside, here's a broad context for the state of Kansas. Uh, I'm leveraging those early April damage estimates that are in the uh, NCBA commission study that Oklahoma State led. I'm leveraging a early April report from Iowa State's card on the hog side to get you know, damages per head. So those are separately for the hog sector and then the three different subsectors in the cattle industry. You can read those down here. And then what I'm doing is multiply them by what we think the size of the Kansas industry is. The cow-calf side's pretty straightforward. You can use the USDA's NAS January cattle inventory report. 1.4 million cows is how we started the year. That's pretty straightforward. Uh, the almost 3 million head in the feedlot follows the same approach we used in the uh, OSU lead study. The one I have the biggest pause on here is actually how many animals in the background or uh, stocker segment are affected. I have almost 3.1 million. You'll see that in the middle of this table. There's no good estimate on that. So there's national estimates for that sector, but there's nothing state level. So that's a seat of the pants appropriation to the state. And then the number of hogs is uh, basically reflecting our share of the market hog situation. At the very bottom of this, I really won't read every number to you, is that's $1.6 billion. And the way I would interpret this is using those damage estimates from those two different ports and my best assessment of how large the hog and the cattle industry is in the state of Kansas here in 2020, that's the effect that COVID has had on the markets compared to what the world would have looked like without COVID. So I would, I would interpret these as one way to think about the damage of COVID. So it's not a profit statement because there's other things driving profit. This is a marginal effect of COVID for these three different sectors. Importantly, this says nothing about government payments. So like all of us have said three or four different ways, you know, tune into Robin's, the, the webinar she's leading tomorrow, uh, specifically for the feedlot sector. If you sold cattle before April 15th, potentially you're eligible for a $214 payment. Well, that would correspond with the head damage here that I have for feedlot sector, for example. So some of the damages are gonna be offset, but what I wanna impress on you is it's very unlikely that those payments make anybody whole. I'm not sure that was the purpose and I'm not aggregate, you know, arguing it should have been, 
we're very likely going to have a large negative effect regardless of those government programs. And the actual effect of that is going to change over time. That's really all I want to say here. Other than to apologize, I now notice there's a link to an old um, news article that's at the bottom of the slide. I failed to delete it when I pulled the slide together. So that's irrelevant for tonight. It's from an old slide. But that is all I will say there, and we'll see whatever the questions we might have. Right now, we just have one question from Louise Emke. Uh, do you think most government payments are near totally capitalized into the farm economy? And I don't know, if Kevin or Greg, who wants to take that? But the rest of you can get on if you want. Go ahead first, Greg. <laughs> um, well, I mean, as far as the, the payment being used in agriculture, I would say that's almost a definite yes here because I don't, I don't think too many farmers are going to make a go of it without those payments. So, well, I'm looking there. Are they? Um, you got to say. So, what happens with those dollars? Are they being? set aside or are they being brought back into uh, production on those farms, brought into uh, asset purchases? Uh, is it uh, influencing uh, the financial position that the farms are in? And I, I think to a, to a large extent, you could say that is the case. We've got uh, farms that are utilizing those to uh, cover living expenses uh, on, on some end and, and uh, it's uh, influencing um, activity of those farms as well. Glenn, anything you would add to that? I will just add, I think in many ways, it's speculation on the livestock side of the effect of those. Um, and I'll split that apart a little bit more, particularly the cattle sector. Uh, historically, the cattle sector has actually not wanted government involvement. They've ran the other way from government payments in many cases. Um, I'm not advocating for the checks, please don't misunderstand me, but I think it's telling of the times that the cattle industry is actually wanting these payments at the moment. So exactly how those payments are used, are they just used to remain solvent? That is possible as opposed to, you know, elevating pasture values, for example. Um, it's also possible that some are going to get a check that were decently positioned going into this and that it gets capitalized into the pasture land market as well. So I think we have to look backwards on that for the livestock sector, but for the grain sector where government payments aren't new, I 100% agree with what Kevin said. Well, folks, go ahead. I think we've answered everything. If we missed something there, let us know. Or if you have something else, go ahead and let us know what it is. From John Campbell, how is land rent or owned land or crop share arrangements figured in the net income? Okay, when we uh, look at the overall KFMA data, <clears throat> certainly any cash land rent that is paid is going to be, uh, be in the figures. Uh, if you look at our uh, data summaries, there will be a, a um, item there for cash rent and that will represent uh, cash rent paid on the land that is cash rented. Uh, the way that uh, the crop share arrangements are going to enter into uh, that net income figure is going to be uh, by way of the, the crop share that uh, the landlord share is not entering into the uh, value of production of those farms. And so that's set aside. Uh, owned land is certainly going to uh, show up from the standpoint of our whole farm data. Uh, the, the ownership of that land is going to show up as uh, the real estate taxes that are paid. Uh, certainly any interest on the um, uh, money that's borrowed relative to that, uh, any other land ownership costs and such. Uh, we do not bring a land charge back in relative to the whole farm data. On our enterprise analysis, if you look at those, there will be a, a land charge that shows up as, uh, as part of the overhead expenses of those, uh, those enterprise analysis. And that char land charge is is essentially a computation to uh, largely represent what would have been a crop share cost of that owned land. Uh, that's how we work through computing that so that it is, uh, it is offset. So hopefully that answers the question as to how that comes into, uh, into our data.
And I don't see any more questions. So with that, I will go ahead and formally close it. Thanks for being on and we'll catch you another time. And thanks guys.